Thank you for tuning in today, pleasant parishioners and partners of PG. We pray that something is said that is impactful and something is meaningful. Thank you for sharing with us. Join us in our worship service. consult with the God of our faith. God, we thank you again for who you are. We thank you for allowing us this time and this space to share your word. God, we pray now that 
Your word is a light unto our feet and a lamp along our pathways. God, we pray that your word changes someone's heart. The Lord God illuminates their way. God, we pray that someone is closer to you as a result of the sharing of this word. God, I pray now uh, that uh, the words of my mouth and the med meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, our strength, and my Redeemer, who is our Redeemer. Let us all say virtually and together, amen and amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you would go with me to the book of Mark, if you look in your Bibles, you will look uh, at one of the synoptic gospels, the book of Mark, the book of Mark, the book of Mark, Mark, the second chapter, Mark, the second chapter, Mark, the second chapter, and we will read uh, the first through the 12th verse, uh, verses. And brothers and sisters, I will be reading from the King James Version. There you will find this particular saying. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noticed that he was in the house. You ought to say together, thank God that Jesus is in the house. And straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick and of palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let him down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto them and to the sick and the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves. He said to them, why reason you these things in your heart, whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, the sins be forgiven of you, or you say, arise and take up your bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick that has paralysis, you say, arise, take up your bed and walk, and go thy way into your own house. 12 says, immediately the sick man rose. He took up his bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were so amazed that they glorified God, saying, we never saw it done in this fashion. And brothers and sisters, if you would uh, just bear with me for just a few quick minutes, and I want to use as a subject for this particular pericope, what a friend we have. What a friend we have. Brothers and sisters, friendship, as we all know, is an extremely important component of life. Nevertheless, as we trod and tread this ontological track, we come to discover that true friends also are a rare and scarce commodity on this purposeful and passing pilgrimage. Friendship is a reciprocal relationship whereby both or all parties are interdependent 
upon each other. And I'll share this with you, brothers and sisters, on this short sojourn with the Savior. It is a good thing to have a good friend. One proverb says that steel sharpens steel, but one friend sharpens another. This underscores and emphasizes the overarching theme of the interdependence or the reaffirming relationship, if you will, that we need to have, number one, between God and brothers and sisters, we need to have the same relationship uh, uh, or strong relationship that we have with God, and we've got to have a strong relationship with the body of Christ, which means each other. And I'm sure that when we have heard, often heard, uh, we've often heard that no man or woman, for that matter, is an eye. In other words, we cannot do things on our own. We cannot, uh, brothers and sisters, we are not living alone in this world. Therefore, we need someone to help us make it through. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that theologian Henry Nouwen said in his wonderful work, The Road to Daybreak, he says, when we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us, we often find that it is those who instead of giving advice or solutions or cures or uh, have chosen rather just to sit there and listen to us and share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender heart. In other words, brothers and sisters, a true friend, they may not know the answer to your problems, but I rest assured that they will walk with you through your problems. Now when further says that the friend who can sit silent with us in a moment of despair and in a moment of confusion who can stay with us in an hour of grief and of bereavement who can tolerate not knowing, not curing, not healing and face with us the bitter reality of powerlessness with us. That is a friend, that is a friend indeed and that is a friend who cares. In this experience of life, a true friend, although not fully certain of how to remedy perplexing situations, a friend is a very present person, one who endures or abides with us throughout the process of our perplexities. A good friend is around even when good times are not. This Coralite psalmist once said in Psalm 46 and 1, he says that God is our refuge and God is our strength. And I'm so glad I can shout at this moment that he says that he is a very present help in the time of our trouble. In other words, we, say we serve such a God who does not escape us when we experience the troubles of life. We serve a God who walks with us and talks with us when we face the worst times of life. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, that although you are walking through despair, understand that God is still with us. This then becomes the true definition of a friend is that God is a friend who walks with you even though times are not well. Consequently, this places us at the hermeneutical doorsteps of our text. Look, if, look with me, if you will, at the world of our text. Listen to the reverberating roar and the rumble of a noisy crowd who gathered 
outside as they discovered that Jesus had returned home. And I want to pause parenthetically, brothers and sisters, and say that it's a good thing when Jesus has returned home. Look around, some joked, some jested, some jived, and perhaps they were anxious and awaiting an anointing. Some were attentive while Jesus stood at the door, while he stood at the doorway of the house and he preached a mighty and monumental word. But my spiritual imagination, as in, in my spiritual imagination, as I stand on the portico and the porch with Jesus, and as I pan across the ocean of the multitude over the rustling and bustling crowd, I see what seems to be an ailing, paralytic, disabled man lying on a dusty, dirty, soiled mat. Have you ever been in that place, my brothers and sisters, where it just seems like you are laying on a dusty, dirty, dehabilitated mat? It seems like nobody can help you, but you're glad you got some good friends. As we look at the text, the closer we see, we see that this man was paralyzed. He was on a dusty mat. They were moving through the crowd. Four men who are carrying this paralyzed man, they stayed with him until he was able to receive his help through Jesus. And I want to challenge someone today, brothers and sisters, are you willing to hang on to someone? Are you willing to continue to carry them to Jesus until they receive the help they need from the Lord? These men are now moving toward the house with urgency. They are moving toward the house with emergency and expectancy. They are moving toward the house expecting that Jesus is going to do something. And I want to pause again, brothers and sisters, and share with you that you need friends that will help you move toward Jesus with expectation that he'll turn your life around. Brothers and sisters, and although the text is silent about their relationship to the paralyzed man, Inductive and deductive reasoning says that these four men might have been some good friends. Friends who would suspend a segment of their own significant schedules to see that somebody else meets Jesus. Are you that type of friend that you would suspend or you would sacrifice your time so that somebody else can get close to the Lord. They were good friends. They suspended uh, their schedules so that they could help somebody else meet Jesus. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, that's what it is meant to have a good friend. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, our blessings come because of the actions and interventions of folks that mean you well. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we've experienced blessings because of the actions and interventions of good friends. There's somebody here today who has the job that they have because of the actions and interventions of good friends. There's somebody out there today who has experienced having brothers and sisters a scholarship because of the actions and the interventions. But somebody was bailed out because of the actions of a good friend. As we give attention to this text, I admire several characteristics about these men because they have qualities that each one of us as faithful friends of God must possess. And I'll raise these particular characteristics and I'll uh, go back to my seat. The first characteristic is in the text, the text teaches us 
that good friends will take you where your handicap will not allow you to go. Let me say that one time, brothers and sisters, somebody missed it. Somebody uh, was not listening. Brothers and sisters, good friends will take you where your handicap will not allow you to go. Let me dissect that for just a minute. I would like to explicate it for just a second uh, for you, uh, for those of us who probably did not get it. The text says that this man was sick with palsy. I want to look at a couple of different versions of the text. New Revised Standard Version simply says that he was paralyzed. In other words, this man was in a state of paralysis. In other words, he could not do anything on his own. He was handicapped. He could not move on his own, much less reach the Savior through his massive, through this massive crowd. He was need in need of healing. His healing perhaps was in full view, but his handicap prevented him from reaching his goal. His handicap, brothers and sisters, sometimes in life, uh, if we're handicapped, our handicap will prevent us from getting to where we need to be. Talk to me, somebody. I watched one time, brothers and sisters, when I was a young man, I watched one of the pastors of a church in Germantown, Tennessee. Brothers and sisters, he became diabetic. They had to cut off all his legs. They, they, cut, they cut off both his, his legs, and he could not... Uh, make it to the pulpit, but when I, as I reflect on Reverend Itson in his days of preaching, brothers and sisters, what I could see was folks picking him up and carrying him to the pulpit, and that was a place he could not get on his own, and as I reflect in my maturity, those were some good friends who helped him to get to where he needed to be. All I'm saying is that you need some good friends that can take you where your handicap will not allow you to go. You need good friends. He couldn't do it on his own. He couldn't move through the massive crowd, but he knew his healing was available. And our brothers and sisters want to share with you that your neighbor can perhaps help you to get to where Jesus wants you to be. Help can be within full reach, but sometimes your handicap can prevent you from going. And I want us to understand that all of us in life have some level of handicap, and we need a good friend that can help us reach the Lord. Help can be within full reach, but your handicap can prevent you. My brothers and sisters, I also know that Satan can paralyze you. As we think about this in physical terms, I want you to I want to also challenge you to think about this in spiritual terms. Satan can paralyze you. Satan can prevent your progress and when Satan paralyzes you, you get a bad case of you on ice. Somebody said, well, Reverend, I, I don't know what you mean by you on ice. Well, uh, when you get you, you on ice, you won't come to church, you won't pray, you won't sing, you won't fast, you won't tithe, you won't forgive, you won't serve, you won't resist the devil, you won't submit to righteous, you won't like holiness, you don't like people, brothers and sisters, when you get a bad case of you won't idols, you won't help yourself. There's someone in this place, uh, virtually, right now, who is paralyzed and don't even know that it is Satan who has you paralyzed. Brothers and sisters, sometimes our friends, and our family, our familiars can be so paralyzed by the bleak realities of their present circumstances that they won't go to the Lord on their own. 
There's somebody you know that is so paralyzed by depression. There's someone who you know that is so paralyzed by anxiety. There is someone who you know that is so paralyzed by low self-esteem that they won't go seek the Lord on their own. So therefore, brothers and sisters, you need to be a good friend to help that person get into the presence of God. There's someone who's paralyzed. Some people have been so hurt that they divert going to church. That's why we must possess not only the character of a good friend, but we must possess the character of a godly friend, a Christ-like confidant. And we must carry our brothers and sisters before the Lord when they are not able to carry themselves. The word of God charges us with being concerned about our family, being concerned about our neighbors, and being concerned about our friends. I wish I had some help in here. Well, I do have some help in here. You all remember James 5, 19 and 20, don't you? It says, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and turns, and if you turn him back, let him know, my brothers and sisters, uh, that they who turn a sinner from the error of their ways, his soul from death will cover a multitude of sins. Galatians 6 and 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, you ought to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. In other words, brothers and sisters, when somebody else falls, you ought not get on Facebook and post about it, but you ought to pray about it. You ought to help that person get back into the good graces of Jesus Christ. And I just want to take this momentary minute before I mosey uh, back to my seat, brothers and sisters. I want you to understand uh, that any time uh, we get into a place and a position of a paralytic, we need somebody to place us before God. You might not have been down so low and you may not have been in such a predicament where you needed somebody to take you before the Lord in prayer. But brothers and sisters, you need somebody to help move you into the pray, pray place and the presence of Jesus. That helps me to understand uh, uh, why uh, the songwriter says uh, somebody prayed for me had me on their mind, took just a little bit of time, and they prayed for me. And that, brothers and sisters, is a blessing when somebody thinks enough of you to pray for you. It's a blessing when somebody has you on their heart and has you on their mind in such a way that they pray for you. That brings up another characteristic of a good friend, but brothers and sisters, the next characteristic of a good friend is a good friend lifts heavy loads. A good friend, you ought to tell somebody virtually. You ought to type it, text it, email it. A good friend helps lift heavy loads. We need some friends who know how to lift you when you can't stand on your own. I want to say that again. Let me rewind that for just a second. You need some good friends, brothers and sisters who are able to help lift you when you cannot stand on your own. For the text indicates that these men lifted their friend to get him up to Jesus. We need some friends. <laughs> Again, on this sumter with the Savior, with the sable skin Savior, we, we need someone uh, that when you are down, they will lift you up. Uh, not long ago, brothers and sisters, I saw 
a basketball player when he was coming uh, from a bad play, he had a teammate just to lift up his head. You need a good friend that can help you lift up your head when your heart is downtrodden. We don't need friends to talk about how bad your credit was and the reason why you didn't get that house. We don't need uh, friends that when your money is funny, they laugh at you. We, brothers and sisters, those of us who have ever fallen by the wayside of life, uh, we can, we need to be lifted by the love and the compassion of a good friend. That's why the old hymn says, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my disparaging cry from the waters, lifted me, and I'm now safe in him. The last characteristic I want to briefly mention as I rush with rapidity to my conclusion, brothers and sisters, good friends go far. Good friends go far. As we give the text one last glimpse, we see that this, these friends go over and beyond the call of duty to be sure, ensure, and make sure that their paralyzed pal is protected and restored. These four fellows were deeply concerned about their friend. That's what kind of friend we need. That's what kind of friend that we need when the body of Christ, uh, that's what kind of friend that we need within the body of Christ when storms rise and winds rage. They didn't just watch him, but they engaged with him. They didn't just sing about it. They didn't just hope about it. They didn't just talk about it. They didn't just wish about it. They didn't just pray about it. But what they did was they did something about it. These men literally went over and beyond the call of duty. For they went over and beyond, on to the rooftop, and beyond the throng of the crowd, removed a portion of toweling from the rooftop. And in my spiritual imagination, I can see that perhaps they knotted their belts together. They used it as a hoist and lowered him down to finally meet Jesus. Good friends, go far. And if you're a child of God, you ought to want to go the extra mile to help someone to meet Jesus. In life, we've got to learn how to be creative. In getting a parallel, a paralyzed generation to see Jesus. In this life, we've got to be creative. We've got to do whatever it takes to get a paralyzed people to meet Jesus Christ. Sometimes we can't do it like it's been done. We've got to do everything in our power and in our creativity to get a paralyzed people to see Jesus. I mean, Jesus went a mighty long way to help his friends. Someone said that he came down 42 generations. He came through Bethlehem. <laughs> I can get happy here by myself. He came through 42 generations. He came through Bethlehem uh, in a manger. He came through Bethlehem, and not only in a manger, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and he came 
through Capernaum. Brothers and sisters, he came riding on a donkey. He came and gave his hands to the nails, his head uh, to the thorns, his side to the spear. He hung his head in the locks of his shoulders. He gave up his life because no man took it and he did all of that for a free. He died. One of the things about Jesus is he didn't stay dead. I'm glad today that I serve a God that's so able that he didn't stay dead. He went all the way unto death. And brothers and sisters, he didn't go like we go. We go until death. We go and watch our loved ones be buried. We watch them uh, the, we watch the preacher commit their bodies ashes to ashes, dust to dust, dirt to dirt, uh, waiting on the general resurrection. And we walk them all the way to the cemetery. And that's until death. But brothers and sisters, I'm glad that we have a savior that will walk us on over onto death. He walks into death with us. But the blessed thing about it is, he comes out of death because on the third day, oh, I'm about to shout today, brothers and sisters, on the third day, he died, but he didn't stay dead. He died, he didn't stay dead. Oh, the old preacher said early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. Good friends, go far. What a friend. We have in Jesus all our griefs and sins to bear. Brothers and sisters, we have such a good friend in Jesus. The door is open. The door is open. I, I open the door of the church. The virtual door of the church is open. What a good friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. You know, we do all of this stuff, but we can forfeit all of this stuff if we put our hands in the hands of a good friend. And his name is Jesus Christ. The door again is open. The door of God's church is open. Brothers and sisters, this is a time where you need a savior. You need a savior. We're living in 2020. It's taking a lot of our black heroes. Uh, we got the COVID-19 We've got law enforcement killings, not only of black people, but of righteous law enforcement officers. Brothers and sisters, we have leadership that has gone awry. We have sickness, death across the land. Now is a mighty good time to join the church. The door is open. One of the ways you can join Pleasant Green, and we'll be happy to be uh, a church home for you. One of the ways that you can join Pleasant Green is to send us a, an email at ghpruitt uh, at gmail.com, ghpruitt at gmail.com, or you can reach out to a pleasant parishioner. And brothers and sisters, I guarantee you that within 48 hours, someone will be reaching back out to you. Brothers and sisters, again, uh, we are thankful for your presence. Thank you for all of our guests uh, who are watching uh, that are a part of another ministry. We thank God for you. We are a church who uh, is striving to become pleasantly purposeful for all people. We thank God for you. Also, we just want to mention and encourage all of you just just to continue your uh, your 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 giving. Your giving. You have done pleasant parishioners. You have done an awesome job throughout this pandemic. Uh, in your giving. And I want to encourage you to continue giving. And we have several opportunities for generosity. If you want to exhibit a level of generosity, there are a couple of ways to do that. You can send a uh, check or a money order uh, to 1220 R-E-B, Rail, G-H, Pruitt, uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. You can send that a check or a money order to REV, Rev, G.H. Pruitt, 1220, G.H. Pruitt, 
uh, uh, Pruitt Place, at 63113 St. Louis, Missouri, or you can give brothers and sisters online at www.pgmbcstl.org. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are thankful for you again. Thank you for sharing with us. We pray that this has been inspirational and evoking for you. Until we meet again, let's say I have a word of prayer. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for being the God of all. We thank you for smiling on us even during this time of pandemic. God, we pray that someone who is exhibiting or, or experiencing rather this time of pandemic, Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that they experience a time of praise and not only a time of praise, but a time of God's providence. God, we thank you again for smiling upon us and now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of God's glory with exceedingly joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. May God bless you. We see you next time. We are so glad that you have come to share with us in our worship service today. I pray that something has been said that has changed your life and I pray that this worship service has been inspirational, encouraging, and evoking. Until we meet again, may God bless you.